Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, CXL and coffee notional computing. Um, Sam Plain has a previous presentation, scare people. Um, and I'm going to go pretty quickly on what coffee notional computing is, what it means for a device, and then go through finally CXL. So coffee notional computing, I'm taking the definition from the uh, coffee notional computing consortium, um, which I think is part of the Linux foundation. Um, so, you know, you want a trusted execution environment. It means that your data, um, you're running inside an isolated environment and only some, whatever you trust is, is allowed to access your data. So usually it means that you can run your workload without the hypervisor or anybody else being able to spy on you or to see whatever you're doing. Um, so it comes with a bunch of requirements, obviously. Uh, you need to be able to attest the platform you're running on. Uh, you know, if you cannot attest that the CPU uh, you're running on is uh, providing you uh, an enclave, then uh, you don't really exist. Uh, you want data integrity, making sure that nobody can modify or alter the data you have inside your environment. You want confidentiality, nobody can spy on what the data is, so encryption, really. Uh, but not only encryption, isolation is also very important. And you want uh, code integrity. Um, so that's often seen as an optional thing, but uh, it's also very important if you uh, don't want somebody just to modify the code to extract the data you're running inside your TE. Um, so most of the time, TE is through hardware enclave. So Intel, AMD, and ARM, they all have their different naming for that. Um, Bohr also have a different naming for that, but you know everybody has a name for that, but it's just, it's just an hardware enclave, really, uh, where your VM, usually a uh, trusted VM, uh, can run. Um, the threat really is any other um, application on the host. The host operating system is also seen as a threat. The system administrator is seen as a threat. The service provider, or cloud provider is seen as a threat. So it means that you do not trust anybody, basically, in that kind of scheme. You are like a, a, a customer, you want to run a VM in the cloud or wherever, but you don't want the cloud provider to be able to access your data or to be able to modify your data or to do anything with your, uh, your code or application. Um, bunch of things that are optional, like uh, code confidentiality when you launch your uh, application and so on. So, and also recover things. So, you know, if there is some kind of event that happened, it's not just really somebody attacking you, but it might be some our fault happening, uh, some signal integrity and whatnot. Uh, so, you know, there is like things if you want to recover from a, a, a state of panic, basically. Um, I want to touch on, on one thing is the, what I call the, the pyramid of trust is as soon as you have one layer that is compromised by any means, you know, it's, I'm talking generally here, it means that all the layer above it are also compromised. Um, you know, if your IP browser is compromised, then it means any VM running inside that, that host is compromised, unless you have secure VM with Enclave. Um, so the outcome of that is that if you want to protect and create Enclave, the only way to uh, be able to achieve that is by having the hardware as the lowest layer, is by protecting the, making the uh, trusted execution of environment inside the lowest layer. Um, and so like the security is, is you know, as, as strong only as a, uh, uh, the, the lowest layer. Um, so one of the bonuses of, of making the enclave inside the, inside the hardware is that you can remove the operating system and and uh, the cloud provider from the trust space. So it means, you know, if um, the enclave is provided by the hardware, uh, you don't have to trust your operating system, the BIOS and whatnot that is running on, the, on your computer. So roughly the architecture, how it looks when we're looking at VM, uh, you have uh, the CPU with a security module, you have your hypervisor, which is like most likely Linux. Uh, I mean, with this Linux members after all. Um, and you have the trusted VM, um, and basically what happens is that whenever you have memory that is assigned to the VM, um, the VM can first authenticate the memory and say, okay, I'm accepting that memory and talk to the six CPU security module and the CPU security module gonna program a bunch of table and make, uh, isolate the memory from the hypervisor. And at that point, the trusted VM can start using that memory. Um, and so that you have like uh, the uh, security module that's uh, enforcing isolation from, uh, everything else in the system. So what it means for device is that um, 
if you want a trusted execution environment in the device, you want the same kind of thing, really. You want to be able to attest the device. You want that the device protect the integrity of the data. You want the device to uh, have confidentiality for your data. You want the device also to have code integrity for the code running on the device. Um, and again, you want that to be in hardware. You know, same as, as for the CPU, really. Um, but again, same as for CPU, you cannot trust all the block inside your device. You know, you, your device, like I'm printing your very basic uh, abstract device, um, and your device doesn't, um, can have so many blocks that you cannot really trust every other blocks. So, you know, usually you have uh, the uh, idea is that you have this kind of root of trust and then um, everything else uh, fall from that, um, from that block. Um, Another issue with device is that uh, you also have to think about how one hardware block can be used to attack another hardware block. And so you have to use, to think about boundaries and what you can do also for debugging and so on. Because often uh, devices, unlike CPU, have not been isolated as much as, as uh, a CPU really. So it means that uh, when you look at a debugging feature on, on, I don't know, a GPU for instance, or uh, some kind of accelerators really, um, often, if you uh, use JTAG or whatnot, you can access the full states of a block, which means you can also access the data as an inside an hardware block. So, which means it gives you a window into the um, whatever application is running. So, if you want uh, isolation, you want device enclave. Um, so, you know the way we're doing today with PC Express is um, think like SRIOV and so on. Uh, so you can have a, a virtual function that is assigned to a specific TVM and only uh, application inside a TVM run inside an enclave on the device and the device can isolate every virtual machine workload. Um, so yeah, the, the checklist really is uh, um, trusted execution environment, um, root of trust that give you attestability, um, the way to measure device, uh, device isolation for integrity, confidentiality, um, and obviously you also need to protect the traffic between the CPU and the device. And that's going to be really the, the chunk of the talk here because, you know, CXL is a um, fabric. So the issue is uh, you want to protect the communication between the CPU and the device. Um, there's many ways that somebody can attack that traffic. Um, you can have a PC Express switch or a CXL switch between you and the device. And somebody might have um, a tech taking control of, uh, of the firmware of that switch. Or you can have a cable and someone just put some kind of interposer between uh, you and, uh, and the device. And what the attacker can do is like, uh, you know, modify traffic, inject traffic, delete traffic, replay traffic, um, spy on the traffic, look what, what is the data, um, and also do side channel. So it's like, oh, um, this same memory has been written again and again with the same pattern, same memory. Uh, that might be a way to to uh, guess something. So the integrity is going to protect the first um, the first four actually, um, and uh, yeah, well the encryption is going to protect the last two. Um, so integrity, the idea is that for every message you have on your on your uh, prod on on your fabric on PC Express, EXL. Uh, you want a, a message authentication code. So it's basically a, a hash of your messages, a cryptographic hash of your messages that say, okay, uh, you need to know the key to be able to compute the, the cryptographic hash of the messages. And it will protect you against, um, um, against you know, all the force, uh, first of all, like modifying traffic, uh, being able to uh, 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 replay traffic because you also use a counter usually. So it means that uh, both sides look at uh, uh, every messages and they have a counter, they keep incrementing and they keep in sync. Uh, so it means that they expect uh, to have a certain number of messages. Um, so that's for integrity, for encryption. Um, the idea is that you only protect the data. You're not protecting the uh, uh, address or the code or whatever of the traffic. You only uh, um, protect the payload. Uh, of a PCI Express. So, you know, it can be a memory read, so you're going to protect the memory, uh, not the uh, address or things like that. Um, usually, you also want to use some kind of salt or counter again, uh, because if you use the same encryption, depending on the encryption algorithm again, uh, if you use a, an encryption algorithm that for the same data gives you the same output result, then somebody can use that as a side channel attack because he's seeing the same pattern being written again and again. And so that's also a way you want to, to protect yourself against. Um, 
Another thing you want to do, uh, because you have context on both sides, you have context on the CPU side, your trusted VM, and your trusted VM gonna have a context on the device side too. And so you would like to be able to assign traffic so you know that one traffic message is, is assigned to a, a specific context on the device. Um, otherwise, um, a context on the device might pretend to, uh, to be attached to a different context on the CPU and be able to spy on that other CPU context. Um, so that's one thing you also would like to have. Um, a touch on, on topology. So, you know, um, you can have very complex topology, uh, especially with CXL. Um, so you can have like a CPU connected to a switch and the switch can be connected to a fabric. And the fabric is multiple switches, basically. Um, you know, um, any number of resonal limit, I think, on CXL, like 4,000 maybe, but can be a big number. Um, and so you can have like, you know, many, many devices between the CPU and the end device. You can have many, many switches. Um, so that's, um, that can be an issue. Uh, so you have two kind of uh, encryption and protection. You can do point to point. That means that you go from CPU to first switch, encryption and integrity between the two. And then this first switch is decrypting the, the traffic and re-encrypting again for the next destination. And so it's up to a point to point. So, you know, from one point to the next, which means you have to trust every single point in the pass. Uh, otherwise, um, if any point in the pass is compromised, then that point in the pass can escape the traffic and access the traffic in plain text. So you, you completely lose um, your protection if you do a point to point and one of the points is a weak point. And if you do end-to-end, -end, the idea is that only the two on points need to know about the encryption keys and, and the integrity keys, and only the two on points uh, can, um, can understand each other. It means that any point in the fabrics, it just passing along messages. So if you think of it as like TCP and SSL, really like, you know, you have a packet that is protected by SSL and all the switch on the internet, they're just passing along packets. They don't care about what it is or should not care about what it is. Um, so yeah, so that's the big thing about uh, computational computing and what it means for CXL. So maybe a quick overview of CXL. Um, it's really a, a new protocol that is geared toward um, cash ground load and store. Um, you know, it allowed to add memory to CXL that be of like the main memory you have. Uh, you can also have accelerators and so on. Um, and one of the things uh, you have to, to understand from that is that it's dealing with cache line, 64 bytes. So it means that every message on CXL cannot have an header or, you know, the metadata for the message cannot be too big. Otherwise, your bandwidth efficiency is going to be really bad. If you have more than 64 bytes to describe the 64 byte of data, then, you know, like what's the point of your interconnect really at that point? Um, so you want to have very few fields, and that's what CXL has, very few fields. Uh, just OPECO, the physical address, and few ancillary bits. Um, so there isn't much for the header, basically, which is an issue for security. Um, one of the issues with CXL, it's all about physical addresses. So it's HPA or physical addresses. So there is no IOMMU, there is no filtering in it of anything. Um, if you are a CXL devices, a type two or type one devices, you can access any memory on the system uh, and you have full access. Um, that's what the specification says really. So there is no IOMMU, nothing that can block you. So it means you must trust the device that the device will not try to read and or write um, or snoop to think that you should not. Um, and there is no more central access control. You know, you don't have a IOMMU or some central point where you can program the access control. It means that you have to program access control everywhere uh, in the device and uh, uh, every device uh, you might have. So that's one of the issues with CXL when it comes to security and computer computing, uh, you have to keep in mind. Another issue is traffic identification. So I talked about it, you know, when you have multiple contexts. Uh, on the CPU and on the device, um, how do you identify the traffic? Well, you can't. Um, there is no way to assign an ID inside the header. So there is no, no way to identify traffic on CXL. Uh, so when you have a device uh, asking the CPU for a specific cache line, 
um, the CPU has to trust that the, the device is authorized to access that cache line. Uh, there is no way for it to uh, to know um, if the uh, context on the device is actually authorized to access that. Um, Another one is CXL IDE. Uh, so CXL IDE is like PC Express IDE for, for those who know it's integrity and data encryption. Um, on CXL, it's only point to point, which means you have to trust every point. Uh, in the past, um, you know, kind of bad for a GCB. So GCB is a trusted computing base. So it means everything you want to trust. And if you want confidential computing, you want to limit the trust the GCB. You want to limit the number of devices you trust. Uh, the more people you have to put inside your circle of trust, uh, the less, um, you know, the more scary you should be. Um, and the last one really is uh, rock devices. Um, so CXL memory device, uh, all, all the ones that are going to hit the market have an ARM CPU really, or a CPU doesn't have to be ARM, but so far I'm only seeing ARM. Uh, and it's pretty powerful. So, you know, it's not a sample microcontroller. We're talking about like powerful CPU core actually. Um, and, you know, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about having a CPU in your memory, really? Because that that CPU can access all the memory, that is CXL memory. Um, so yeah, uh, maybe um, um, you should be scared about that. Um, so what happens if the attacker take control of the firmware? Anyway, you know, like, because it, like, they, they managed to, to break the device or they, they supply chain attack or whatnot, or they found a bug in the firmware and they um, are able to, uh, um, you know, live attack the firmware. Um, and we can also use that to escape memory. So you have two TVM on one on one TXL device, you know, you have like uh, the device uh, sniffing out one TVM context and escaping it to another TVM context. Um, so we talk about multi-host, um, that's even more scary if you think about it because you can have multiple hosts and one host can be attacking another host. Um, so, you know, like the host thing is like you have multi fabric, server A, server B, uh, and we're all using device A and device B. Um, and we can use uh, server B can try to use device A or device B to attack server A. Um, that's also scary. And finally, the multi ad thing, um, we also touch about it. It's kind of the same model. Uh, instead of being a switch, you just have a device that has multiple connections. So it's, um, it's like a switch and a device integrated together. Uh, but you can have multiple different uh, hosts connected to the same devices. And again, that device will have a firmware, will have CPU and so on. So you can also attack the device. Anything else that scares people with CXL? Um, I mean, like, that's the main, all the thing that scares me, but uh, uh, there is probably much more that you should be scared about. Hey, Jerome. Working? David, can you throw your okay. test, 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 yeah, yeah. test. So, <laughs> so you mentioned about the issue with no IMMU in the path. Um, that's not technically true, although it's certainly possible to not implement one. So you, six other devices are obliged to use ATS if they're accessing host memory anyway. Uh, which is fine, and the problem with ATS is always you're saying, I've translated it, and the <laughs> um, believes you. Now, the specs were always written with the intent that it was perfectly permissible to put a checker um, on the path, and that's definitely an option. Whether anyone's done it in their host, I have absolutely no idea. But yeah, so technically it's true, like a CPU can add um, some kind of IO memu to um, block CXL traffic and only allow some uh, addresses to be accessed by specific devices. Uh, so technically it's doable, uh, but I don't think any of the CPU makers is actually looking to doing that as far as I know, but. <laughs> and as far as, as far as we can say here also, yeah. But I mean, if it is a security concern, it's one of those things that I know has been discussed in the past as perfectly doable. Um, it requires some slightly exciting caching. Not yeah, it's not so much of a security concern as it is like something we want to keep in mind. So it means that if we want to have access control, then it means we need to have access control in the device and we need to, tr to be able to trust the device to enforce the access control. And that goes back to all the complexity, like, you know, making a device secure is not that easy. It's not, 
hey, I just have like uh, uh, some controllers that run something. No, one hardware block inside your device can be attacking another hardware block. And like you have debugging port, your JTAG port and whatever. And so like it's holistic, really. Um, yeah, no, I absolutely agreed. It's in the same category as anything inside the actual host. Yes. It looks like it is. So to add, uh, to, add to what Jonathan just said, uh, I can say for a fact that at, at least Intel CPUs uh, do perform ACS upstream forwarding filtering. So unless you have enabled ACS upstream forwarding, all the traffic will be filtered. So that works at least on Intel CPUs. I was uh, I was just gonna ask on the slide we had all the integrity and uh, confidentiality attacks. You had like uh, six or seven of them. Uh, obviously, we want to protect from everything, but it can be useful to distinguish between physical access attacks versus software available. And I feel like you actually sort of touched on it later on when you said if someone figures out how to hack, say, the firmware on the device, which and then the device has these, you know, especially without the IOMMU. So I'm just curious uh, how many of does distinguishing between an, a threat model where you're actually worried about someone getting physical access and like putting a probe on the cable make this a little bit easier? Or is this, um, in your view, all in play, even for somebody who only has, you know, a, a remote connection? Yeah, for me, I, I just like see it's all in play because uh, right now the switches of a very complex firmware. So the attack surface of the firmware is so big that I assume it's very easy to attack a switch. And also, I assume that um, technically a switch is like a physical interposer, really. So, yeah, I, I don't see the physical aspect as a as a problem here. Makes sense. Thanks. Do you get device to device? So, I mean, that that one there shows CPU to device, and most of the other things show boxes of RAM. Do you get GPUs talking to GPUs or things like that? Yes, you can. So it's something we'll look into peer to peer, really. Um, the Apple like device A talking to device B, and then again, um, you want to be able to trust both devices, um, or at least trust the context in, in each of the devices. I thought I had a slide about that, but um, yeah, okay. And also, do you get multiple paths? So do you, do you get redundant paths through the fabric with different encryption potentially? Yeah, so, mil uh, yeah, so let's not talk about multipath. Uh, <laughs> it does not exist today in CXL. might exist sometime in the future. No, I, think I was wondering what the plan is for auditing all the firmware in an open source form that runs in all these devices? I wish. <laughs> so, so, you know, I wish like all the all the firmware on these devices are open source and that they can be audited by everybody and that you can also sign them and have a properly solvable bill and so on. Um, but I think um, it's not going to happen uh, quickly. Uh, it's something we're working on, I think, with uh, many of the um, CXL SOC provider. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's going to happen. And also the biggest issue I think we have at this point is that the hardware itself is not secure. So even if we secure the firmware, there is a way to attack the hardware easily. So, um, you know, first secure the hardware, making sure that your hardware is secure and then, um, the firmware become like the next big thing we need to tackle, but doesn't mean we have to do one after the other, but yeah. Is there, is there a blueprint from, um, uh, like enterprise SSDs right now, like they have powerful cores right uh, inside of them so like a lot of the concerns i think that you have already exist in nvme in, yeah yeah in nvme right and i i guess like that isn't that the blueprint for for doing this and if you can fix it there like cxl i guess the big difference i see with cxl is that it becomes host memory right which, which is that's the big difference right uh, and maybe but all the other concerns already exist with nvme yeah so with nvme the thing is like you have encryption often happening before the before you eat so either before you eat this core the, the data they get is encrypted already so they don't have access to the uh, plain text uh, or when they do have access to the plain text it's only a small chunk inside that that complex thing that has access to the plain text and then it's all encrypted 
Hey, Jerome. So a couple of questions. So one is, can you comment on the CXL types that really apply here in terms of scope? Because I was just thinking, of, if you think, think of a type three device, like a memory buffer device, um, you might have an approach where the CPU SOC encrypts data before going out to those dumb devices. Let's call it a dumb device, just storing, not doing any other additional things that needs clear text access. Yeah, so for type three devices, that's the easiest solution because then it means that uh, whatever is leaving the CPU is encrypted and nobody else outside the CPU knows about anything and doesn't need to know about anything. Right. Um, and so that's the easiest and, and the more secure solution that you could do. Um, sadly, not every CPU necessarily support that. That's true. So the, the type one and type two, it sort of seems like the more... more yeah, type one and type two are going to be more complex because, you know, so far a GPU that will need to do some real work will need to have to access to plain text. You know, we don't have... Um, Right. And then the other related question I had um, for on in the PCI SIG, when, where we have ID, we also have selective stream, right? Which is end to end, as you're suggesting. Can you comment on what are the issues here with CXL that don't allow us to do end to end? I, I mean, I could comment, but it will take hours. Uh, so basically, like the complexity is too big. Um, so like for, the reason why you can do on, on PC Express basically is because you have only free channel on, on uh, PC Express. With CXL, you have 12. So you have a state explosion. Uh, so you have to multiply 12 by 4,000, and then you have to uh, look at number of bytes, and then you look at, it gives you the number of SRAM you have, which is multiple megabytes of SRAM you will need if you want to keep performance good, um, which means the cost is crazy. And if you, yeah, so it's like, just like when you add up the number, um, it doesn't scale. There are some other bits around what you would have to expose because the addressing is part of the routing on CXL, and often the one thing you want to protect is what addresses you're actually accessing. Right, so I can see the key key state explosion thing Jerome is describing. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think we should we should talk more about this. It, it, it's tricky, but talk to your favorite CXL consortium. Yeah, so, so <laughs> rep about it. I assume many people here in the room are actually working for companies that is part of CXL. Um, and so you should really go talk to the people working on CXL in your company and tell them, oh, I actually see something scary <laughs> because it's really scary. Um, and, you know, we talk about all the nice things we can do with memory pooling and memory sharing and so on. Uh, but, you know, if we don't have security in the end, um, that's going to be even more scary. So. Yeah, I mean, memory sharing with confidential computing doesn't really work anyway. So. <laughs> Uh, Very use case actually for that, but yeah, it's like. Uh, All right, let's thank the speaker, yeah. and then we'll come back on on time. Start on time. Thanks a lot. Thank you.